Now, in the book of Jonah, where we are today, uh, Jonah's been called. He's refused. He, uh, he's been in the belly of the fish. I, uh, Kent told me a good story about the belly of the fish. A uh, little girl in school uh, talked about the book of Jonah. Her daddy was a preacher. And she related the story of the, the fish that swallowed Jonah. And the teacher said, honey, that, that is not physically possible. There is no fish who can swallow uh, a human being whole. And she said, well, my daddy's a preacher, and he said it's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, I believe it. And uh, she said, well, what about if there is no fish, if that story's not true? And the little girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk right up to Jonah and, and say, Jonah, did, did you really get swallowed by a fish? And uh, the teacher responded by saying, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And she said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> yes, I believe that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. And you know why I believe that? It's not only because it's in the Bible, but my mama told me it was so. We have a great responsibility uh, to teach these children what the Bible says. Uh, the fish has already happened. Jonah repented. He went to Nineveh. He preached uh, uh, the gospel to, to Nineveh. They repented. And uh, now Jonah just ran away. He, just, he was so disgusted. He was so mad at God. The Bible says he ran over to the east side of Nineveh, which is a, a high altitude, and he sat down just to see if God was going to do anything to these people and if justice would be served. So we come to verse, chapter 4. I would ask that you stand in honor of God's Word as we read chapter 4. It's a powerful passage. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he was angry. You ever been mad at God? Jonah had. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, an abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Now, now what's wrong with that? Jonah had his mind right anyway. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Imagine that. Death better than the mercy of God. How cold can you be? The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant. And it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? 
And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as the animals. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And uh, you may be seated. This is where the invitation comes in. The mercy of God is like an invitation. And God invited Jonah to participate with him in his work. His first invitation came in chapter 1 verse 2 where it says, God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And then again, over in chapter 3, the Bible says the same thing. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to give to you. Uh, One invitation came before the great fish, and one invitation came after the great fish. The first invitation, Jonah disobeyed, resulting in his uh, experience with the fish. And the second invitation came after. I mean, what would you do if a, if a great fish spit you out on the shore? I think I would tend to be uh, kind of obedient, wouldn't you? This is the same invitation that came to the Apostle Paul over in the New Testament. Acts chapter 22, verse 21. God said to the Apostle Paul, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Same invitation given to Jonah and given to the Apostle Paul. It took a great storm, a great fish, a great plant, a giant worm, and a gale force wind to get Jonah's attention. Paul was ready. When God spoke, he obeyed. Now comes the call to you and me. Do you know that you are invited? You are invited to participate with God in his work? Every one of us? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We got to do that last Sunday evening. We baptized five into the kingdom of God, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We did that this morning through Bible study. Sunday school, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the age. Listen to how Paul responded to the invitation God gave to him. It's found in Acts chapter 26, verses 19 and 20. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. Paul was faithful. Everywhere he went, it was an invitation to share the good news. The story of Jesus. And he did not shrink like Jonah did when he was called. 
the story is told of Hudson Taylor, one of the first missionaries in the modern movement during the 1700s. He said this about God's invitation. The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. If I had a thousand lives, I'd give them all for China. How much have you given to win your neighborhood to Christ? How much have you given to win your business associates to Christ? Your schoolmates, your friends, your family, your neighbors. Think about that. William Carey is known as the father of the modern missionary movement. When he wrote to Parliament about his call, his invitation to take the gospel to, the, to India, Parliament wrote back. Listen to what they said to William Carey. They said, the sending out of missionaries into one eastern position is the maddest, most extravagant, most costly most indefensible project which has ever been suggested by a moonstruck fanatic. Does that sound like Jonah? Or does that sound like Paul? The Church of Scotland in 1796 passed a resolution concerning the invitation that Carey felt to take the gospel to India. Listen to what this said. To spread the knowledge of the gospel amongst the barbarians and heathens seems to be highly preposterous. Paul or Jonah? How serious are we this morning, today, about telling people about Jesus? About accepting God's invitation. One more. I think you'll like this one. The House of Commons said this to William Carey. I would rather see a band of devils let loose in India than a band of missionaries. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, when you, when you get up enough nerve and take a step for Jesus to talk to somebody about Christ and they rebuff you, they turn a deaf ear, they even criticize you. Imagine how Kerry felt. Listen to what he said. Why is my soul disquieted within me? Things may turn out better than I expect. This is what I like. He said, everything is known to God and God cares. Do you believe that God cares? He cares enough about the people who do not know Him about the people who are unsaved. He cares enough to invite us to tell them, to be bold about it, to talk about Him everywhere we go. There's two things I want you to know about God's mercy. The first one, write this down. The first one is... God's sovereign mercy is available to all. Look at chapter 4, verse 6 again with me. Chapter 4, verse 6. It says, So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. God had already appointed, that uses the same word, appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah as an act of his mercy to keep him from drowning in the depths of the sea. 
The fish was not his judgment. The fish was his salvation. Then God appointed a plant. As he was out there on the east side of Nineveh, God, I, I suspect it was a great tree. And it drew up, grew up and offered shade for his head and for his discomfort. An act of God's mercy to shelter him, to protect him. And then he appointed a worm. Think about that. Uh, for you that believe that worms have no usefulness, <laughs> here this worm was big enough Invasive enough to take care of this tree that had grown up over Jonah. You know what that was? That was the mercy of God's discipline. I mean, whenever God has to discipline you, do you give thanks? I mean, I mean, our children, when we discipline them, it's for their good, is it not? It, it's so that they will do differently and avoid difficulties and wrong decisions. And then there was a great wind, a great east wind blew in his face. I, 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 I believe that the wind pictures the, the, the word of God. Uh, the wind uh, through the Holy Spirit blowing in Jonah's face prepared him for what God had to say and the questions that God had to ask. This is the reason I brought this, this big old clock to church this morning. Ken has more clocks than you can imagine, so he's not going to miss this clock, right? Someone has compared the mercy of God to the hands on the clock. Okay? The shorthand, that one right there, represents God's discipline. Thank God for God's discipline. God disciplines those whom He loves. It's a part of His package of mercy. He won't let you stray too far without pulling you back. You know? Thank God for it. Then the long hand on the clock represents God's hand of mercy. Discipline and mercy. You know what the difference is between the short hand and the long hand? The long hand has to go around this whole thing before this hand moves one time. Yeah. Sixty times the mercy of God flows out, pours out to one instance of discipline. God. God is abundant in mercy. That's the point. And the, and the deal is, is, that, is that both hands are fastened to a single support. You notice that? Both hands are attached to the same thing, which represents the heart of God and His great love for us. And each time that mercy hand goes and that discipline hand moves, there is a chime. There is a voice that echoes the love of God to us through His tender and wonderful mercy. Be thankful that God is merciful. And the only thing we have to do, the only thing we have to do is share it. That's what we are all called to do. Not only to receive it like Jonah did, abundantly, completely, God poured out upon him in this episode, but he failed to share it. That's his point. That is the point of Jonah. Listen to the question. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, 
the great city in which there is more than 120,000 persons who did not know the difference between their right and their left hand as well as many animals? Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? You know, that is an open-ended question. God does not answer what he asks. That is amazing to me. Some commentators have said, some commentators have said that uh, the, uh, the 120,000 only counts the number of children in the city of Nineveh. Because only children don't know their right hand from their left. Right? Infants, babies. So if the population of Nineveh was 120,000 children, Jonah didn't have enough compassion to even be faithful to share the gospel where there was an overwhelming presence of children involved. How cold would it be for a church not to care about children? Right? I mean, Jesus said, Suffer the children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. The population itself would have been about 600,000 people if 120,000 children resided inside the city limits. So it, it, it is a demonstration of how cold Jonah had become. How hard his heart was. So, so God asked him, should I not have mercy? Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, this great city? And he leaves that, that question open-ended. He does not answer it. You know why? He wants us to answer it. He wants you to answer it. Answer it. Should not God have compassion on the city of Nineveh? On children and upon their families? Answer it. Of course the answer is yes. Uh, God's mercy is free. His compassion is abundant. And it is ready and available to all people. So, I bought a hundred dollar bill to church for me today. And there it is. What if I gave this hundred dollar bill to Ken and uh, he's ready to receive it. Look at him. Eager. Man, he's, he's moving. To get that hundred dollar bill. And what if I said about that hundred dollar bill. That whoever in our congregation. Brings a lost person. With them to church. Whom they have won to Christ. Gets that hundred dollar bill. You're saying. Preacher, you've lost your mind. We need, we need to get you examined. Because you know that winning people to Christ is not about money. You don't buy souls. Now, there's going to be, over the next few months, there's going to be people who spend a lot of money I mean millions and millions of dollars to get their candidate elected. Did you know that? They've already done it. And more is yet required. Because elections are all about money. Did you know that? But not mercy. You can't buy mercy. There's no price you can put on mercy. The only thing you can do 
with mercy is give it away. Be full of it yourself. Don't be like Jonah. Don't be stingy to yourself and just turn your back on God's mercy. Receive it. Bathe in it. I mean, go home, open your Bible, and take a bath in the mercy of God. It's that abundant. And, but then, but then, go help somebody else do the same thing. Someone who may not look like you. How merciful are you? Let me just ask you. How merciful are you when you see the sign, lost my job, will work for food? Are you merciful? How merciful are you when somebody does, does you wrong? I mean, just messes up and harms you or hurts your feelings. How merciful are you? How merciful are you to people who don't show you mercy in return? You know, God's not stingy with His mercy. He really isn't. The only thing that limits the mercy of God is the flow of it through us. That's it. I want Grace Baptist Church to be full of God's mercy and busy giving it away. Busy. Let me ask you, do you need a dose of God's mercy today? There's mercy enough to cleanse you from your sins. Wash them as far as the east is from the west. All you got to do is receive it and it's yours. Do you need enough mercy to save you and give you eternal life? All you got to do is believe in Jesus. And that mercy will swamp you. It will wash away every sin in your life what the Bible says. What if you've messed up this week? Anybody not messed up? Yeah. Yeah. We've messed up. We've messed up. There's mercy enough for us. All we got to do is repent. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be brought to repentance. How big is the word all? Does it include everybody here? Yeah. All to repentance. You have an opportunity now to act upon the word of God and to not be like Jonah, disobedient to the word of God, to his invitation. As he speaks to your heart, you respond in obedience. Don't spend your life on the east side of Nineveh. It's hot. It's humid, it's dry, it's not a place you want to be. Spend your life under the mercy of God. Let's stand to our feet. Let's ask God in our hearts to move. I, I just feel in my spirit there are people here today who, can, who, who need to move in terms of the mercy of God. So let's pray together to that end.